Welcome to the Truth About Real Estate Investing show. My name is Erwin Cito and how are the kids? Mine are keeping busy, they're really busy with the usual stuff. They're in kickboxing, they have swim lessons, they have summer camp, and math and English homework. Yes, during the summer. I hope it's normal to have homework in the summer because I don't even know what normal is. Who knows what normal is anymore? Uh, but did you know that uh, investing in education, especially during the summer, is one of the secrets of the rich? Uh, for kids who continue their education through the summer will hit the ground running when school starts in September. Uh, naturally, if one is good at something, they will take further interest in the subject or sport. For example, if your kid is the best hockey player on their team and they're the leading, and they're the leading scorer, they will likely enjoy the sport. No different if your kid tests among the highest in school. There's a greater chance that child will enjoy education. That's what I'm after. And now, none of this is perfect, however, I'm just trying to put all the odds in my favor. If nothing else, my kids know that hard work is expected from them seven days a week. If they want a day off, they can finish their homework early. That easy. Uh, funny thing is, our kids now get up in the morning before we do. <laughs> after much argument and cajoling, uh, they now do their homework first thing in the morning before they even eat breakfast. Uh, we've explained to them that their energy is highest uh, at the beginning of the day versus at the end of the day. All this summer fun because of all the summer fun they're having they're exhausted uh, but this hasn't been easy uh, we've had lots of arguments with the kids and we have to supervise them to make sure that they, they, they sit and do their homework and then we have to mark all of their homework i don't know how you teachers do it uh, but hopefully learning these habits will be worth it um, now speaking of learning uh, we are covering lots of opportunities to learn my kid cousin uh, chubby he's coming on the show next week to record a podcast as he's completely over the moon, having dub nearly doubled his investment in 18 months, thanks to stock hacking. He's a, a, he's a professional musician, by the way, in case there's anyone out there who has that voice in their head saying that you can't do this too. Or if you think learning a new side hustle, uh, that could, or if you're interested in learning a new side hustle that could potentially earn you better cash flow than real estate without tenants and toilets, well, I had a client tell me this week they're retiring their spouse thanks to their stock hacking returns. Friend of the show, Matt Pichet, will be on the show, uh, the fruitful investor. He, uh, he'll be by because he's loving his new passive cash flow strategy via stock hacking. I think everyone knows he makes tons in real estate. He's doing this as well. Past results, of course, do not predict the future, but if you're at least curious about what you're missing, tune in to a completely free demonstration by me. Simply go to www.stockhackeracademy.ca and there'll be an option there for you to sign up for a future free demo. If you're already on my email list, you'll see, a you'll see a registration link on our list of upcoming events. With COVID restrictions lifting, we will be hosting demonstrations live and in person again in our offices in Oakville, Ontario. Uh, we'll be, of course, be following provincial guidelines, and we will also be live streaming for those of you who live a wee, further, wee bit further away. I'm personally fully vaccinated now uh, for, my, for my third week. Uh, my shots were three, almost four weeks ago now and I'm really happy to see, uh, be seeing people in person again. Uh, speaking of folks whose lives have been changed by stock hacking, today's guest is Joel Arndt. Uh, this is actually a re-release of last year's uh, recording that we recorded in October 2020, and it happened to be the number one show last year. Joel Arndt is a young guy. He's a single dad from North Bay, Ontario. He's a millennial who, like many, wanted to be in real estate, but the reality is the capital to invest in real estate, if you don't have rich parents or relatives, it's a bit steep but he's using this newly learned skill of stock hacking and he's been able to cash flow 30% cash on cash return in 12 months using the strategies taught in Stock Hacker Academy with his $10,000 bankroll. For those wondering, Joel's formal education is in religion as he was going to college to become a preacher of Christianity and he has no formal education in, uh, in finance. He just has something more important, a willingness to learn. Of course, past results do not predict the future, but in my opinion, this is the future of side hustles, especially for those who don't have massive down payments for real estate and those who want some diversification away from real estate without tenants or toilets. I hope you enjoy the show. What's keeping you busy these days, Joel? Just finished Stock Hacker Academy intro course number 2.0, number two. That was definitely busy. And then making sure that all the students have all the information they need. Looked at a property yesterday. Mm -hmm. It was fun. Mm -hmm. And my own stock hacking. Tell me about the property. What, what city? Want? Hamilton. Yeah. Okay. This was cool. I will drive by properties that I think need some attention. Mm. Kind of basic. You know, I want to buy and send them a letter. I want to buy your, your property. But I actually found out who owned the property and sent them a personal letter. 
And that was six months ago. Got the call yesterday. He's like, hey, you sent me a handwritten letter and explained his story. So I went out, saw it. Definitely going to need some work. But uh, <laughs> not the worst property I've ever been in, but um, one of the more interesting ones. And yeah, I think, I think there's some room here depending on where the resale value comes back in. Cool. Like, let's paint a picture for the listener. What made you think this house needed attention? Oh, it just looked like crap outside. A buildup of weeds. You can see that the roof needed attention. Some of the fascia around, or whatever you call that, around the windows was like rotting out. You know, the brick is falling apart. It's just, <laughs> yeah, you know, it hasn't had attention. But what would you put the estimate at? And how much? In oh. dollars, how much work need to be done? That's been tricky. Just on the outside. Oh, just on the <laughs> outside. Because I imagine the inside is just the same, just as bad. Gosh, that's a that's a tricky one because it's I'm I'm not first of all, I'm not the greatest at estimating rental costs. And second of all, because it's it's semis and they're duplexed semis. So Legal? Legal non conforming. Oh he, okay. he bought it that way in the eighties. Okay, okay. So the to redo the, yeah, I don't know. I couldn't give you a confident figure for the outside. Interesting. And and the outside's going to gonna pale in comparison to what the inside needs. <laughs> yeah, because probably all the mechanicals are problem. Are, well, are actually, problematic. That's, so that's actually the the interesting part. He was like starting to do work on. He was starting to rehab a lot of some of the units, and so like, the top two units are are vacant right now. One's mm-hmm. completely gutted. The other is just neglected. And you saw them. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I don't. I didn't see the one. One is tenanted, and I didn't see that one because um, he wasn't able to give her enough notice. Right. COVID times too. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, her side of the lot is tidier than his side of the lot. So. <laughs> oh, she, she's a good tenant. It seems. <laughs> Sounds like yeah. Hmm. And he said he updated. He updated the unit before she moved in three years ago. So it's probably it's an assumption that needs to be verified. But her unit's probably the best one out of all. Interesting. If I had to guess. So you said one's gutted. Yep. Um, so electrical's been almost completely redone. So 200 watt panels, or sorry, 200 amp panels for both both sides. Oh, good. Um, one side has three meters. The other side only has one meter, but um, the third meter is for the basement for shared laundry. You reparged the the ba- it's a wet basement, stone fa- old stone foundation. Definitely, like so some some pump and like the, it was actually the one side some pit was full of water so he had to turn the the valve had stuck so he had to turn it on but it's all fairly recent work like within the last few years mm, um so that's good the yeah exactly there's there's stuff that doesn't probably doesn't have to be done mm-hmm. but the biggest problem will be water damage the roof over the one side is pretty much done it's going to need to be replaced and so water's getting down between the units so if it wasn't for that this would be a this would be a home run. That's where my worry is. Yeah. There's mold. There's obvious water damage in all the units, um, including the main floor ones. So right. it's gone. It's gone through the roof, through the top second floor unit, down to the basement, mm-hmm. or uh, sorry, down to the main floor unit. So interesting. That's the biggest worry, and that'll be the, the negotiating point. Mm-hmm. And uh, otherwise, like it's just the units exactly what you want because mm-hmm. they're blank canvas. All right. Well, the fact that he has significant water damage through the roof would lead me to believe that no bank is going to touch this. Yeah. So then automatically he's eliminated a large part, uh, a large number of the potential buyers out there. That's a good point. And he's going to scare a lot of people away. Mm-hmm. And everything's going to be difficult because if there's mold, then you have to have, it's going to be cautionary to to show it. Everyone wears masks these days anyways. You may want to upgrade to an N95 <laughs> if there's obvious yeah. mold. <laughs> yeah. Eh, it's funny because before COVID, we didn't do these things. We didn't wear masks. No. <laughs> and we saw moldy basements all the time. All the time. There's no way that I was wearing a mask walking into some of these places. And I walked into places worse than this one. And now I'm like, oh, I wonder if I should. But Yeah. Yeah. Now that masks are like readily available, I think I will be wearing a mask more often. Mm-hmm. Like I, I've seen some... I've gone into uh, attics with vermiculite asbestos, oh. and you know I've seen lots of basements with lots of asbestos and lots of mold, including my own properties. Fascinating mm-hmm. stuff. And also, just want to highlight: you mentioned one of the one side had three panels, mm-hmm. so that's a very positive sign that's mm-hmm. legal, because the hydro company, at least these days, they won't they won't install that yeah. unless you can prove uh, legal use. And uh, they don't look like, like I said, that work is done recently. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. very fascinating. And then, what's your intention with this? 
because of the amount of work that needs to be done, it means a lot of cash outlay. Yeah, you have uh, lots of cash. You can <laughs> own, <of> right? <laughs> so it'll probably be a wholesale deal. That for me personally, that'd be the best bet. Unless there's someone who I wouldn't mind like managing it and just walking through that, walking through the rental process and stuff like that. If someone just wants to be the money partner, but they have to know what they're getting into. And I'd have to, because this is going to have problems we don't see. Yeah, yeah. I need someone who's comfortable with that risk. Yeah. That's a little big deal. And just have a, one of our contractors go quote it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and you have a pretty good idea. Of course, well, if he's done some electrical, I have to check the plumbing. The I don't plumbing, think any of that will be hard, that hard. I don't think it'll be check. that hard either. He has three quarter inch lines, mains coming into both units. And oh. some of the stacks are were, were redone too. So did, did, stacks. did this owner upgrade the water supply? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, good. Okay. So for the for listener doesn't uh, doesn't understand, the standard size is quarter inch and it's usually lead for this age of home? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. For that age of home for sure. Yeah. How old do you think the house is? Uh, it's got to be 100 years old. Can you give the major intersection for those who are hardcore on Hamilton? Yep. Gage and King. Oh, okay. Gage and King. Oh, popular area. Yeah. It's right. It's it's sloping. It's an irregular sized lot. It's yeah, a yeah. deep lot too, like 130 plus feet. And so it's right by the tracks that go over uh, that go over King. Mm-hmm. Just after King splits from Maine there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So. Very cool. Very cool. And I, I know there's a lot. This, this is early. You only had one conversation with the gentleman. Some questions I'm sure the, the listener will have is how did you find their information to, in order to follow up with them? Of course, if it's illegal, then don't share it. <laughs> <laughs> For example, we've had past people just share that they just asked they asked the existing tenants if they see them outside. They mm-hmm. just ask them how to reach get re, get a hold of the of the landlord. I did it the hard way. I went to City Hall, looked up the public tax records, and you went uh, physically. Yeah. Oh, okay. this is you know. Oh, right. Six months ago. Yeah. This would have been this actually, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, like this is before COVID. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cause you can't, I don't think you can do this these days. <laughs> he must've gotten that letter longer than six months ago. I didn't even think about that. He had to have been sitting on that for a while now. I'm going to have to look at my notes. Uh, cause I, I keep track of all the letters I send out. So I'll have to look at when I actually send it to him. Fascinating. Yeah. Very. I caught um, you in a lie, Joel. Hmm? I caught you in a lie. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, so I just went to City Hall. I had the address. Go to City Hall. Ask them for the tax roll assessment books. I hand you a massive binder. If like, quick hot tip: get the tax roll yourself, and so then they don't have to look it up, and it's a lot quicker. Otherwise, you sit there forever waiting for it. Which I don't even know if they do that now. I was in City Hall for other reasons the other day, and the windows are crazy. There's not even space to open up the size of binder that they have. So that I don't even know if I'd want to go in and try that right now. But right. Um, yeah. So by, by getting the tax roll number, you mean just going to the city's website? Yep. Pl- plug in the address? Yep. Yeah. Plug in the address. Get, they'll give you the tax roll number and the assessed value, and that which isn't really a thing. But a lot of it's MCAP. It's M- M- MCAP. MPAC. Yeah. And then, uh, although it is handy to know what they're paying in taxes. Um, I don't remember what his was. Yeah. So you just give them the tax roll number. They hand you a big binder and with a sticky to the, open up to the page. So what it is, and it's not up to the minute data it's it's probably like depending on when you go in it could be six nine ten months delayed so if there was a sale anytime in between there it will it won't be reflected right it's still the most accurate way i've found of actually getting direct contact information without the owner giving you consent because <laughs> everything else like even even looking up i've I've done title i've pulled title on properties and it still doesn't give you contact information for the owner mm-hmm. so yeah it even though it's delayed it's probably been the most accurate awesome cool stuff all right so for listeners who doesn't know when did you come on the podcast last time february 2019 oh march okay. 2019 okay and it's just for a fresh list for, I don't know, we have a whole bunch of new listeners since then. I think yeah. the podcast has at least doubled in audience since then. So thank you, Wealth Hacker. <laughs> let's assume that folks don't know the backstory. Why did you reach out to me? How did you reach out to me? You had made a, you had posted something on Facebook and I was going through, okay, so it was probably a little later, a little after March because 2019 was a year of near misses for me. A bunch of, potential opportunities that sounded really cool, explored them in depth to certain degrees, even started with one company and it just, they didn't, they didn't work out. Um, they weren't as advertised or other partnerships came up 
for these for other people that just made sense for them and so i was feeling out you know fighting feeling down on myself about it and um and this was early on in the year already the rest of the year still kind of panned out that way however i remember you posting on facebook about uh joe costanza and being able to turn and you know him making his first purchase and being able to turn anybody into an investor and that tweaked me <laughs> so as polite and as non like oh woe is me as i knew how i sent you a, a facebook message saying okay here's my situation you you made this claim i'm just going to throw this out here and so you responded said why don't you come on the podcast let's talk about it and uh that was that was a fantastic conversation First of all, like you got me reading Brian Tracy's um, Maximum Achievement, which in terms of mindset is number one in my, in, you know, for me so far. And then it kicked off this relationship where, you know, now I get to work side by side. So, so there's a lot, there's a lot to unpack there <laughs> because I've been involved. So the first thing that comes to mind is I remember when Premier Wynn was still in office. So the Premier of Ontario and she legislated that, uh, I don't know if she actually did it or not, but she was, her her problem was that she didn't believe in, oh, she didn't believe in, eh, it sounded like she didn't believe in, she didn't believe in not paying volunteers, not paying interns, stuff like that. So you did some volunteer work for us. Yeah. Was that, was that terrible? No, <laughs> it was, a, it was an incredible break. Please elaborate on that. So I started volunteering at um, the IWIN meetings. I got to be in a room. I think one of the first, first, yeah, one of the first few meetings I volunteered at, Mike and Luke Wyrop presented. Right, right. Like, they're developing condo buildings in downtown Hamilton. Mm -hmm. That was incredible. You know, I'm literally rubbing shoulders. And with, they're your age, too. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, slightly older. I think Michael just turned 30. Did he? Yeah. Good Lord. Okay. Yeah. Luke might be 35. What have I done with my life? <laughs> No, uh, that's that's the wrong the wrong way to think about it. No, so you're in a room with 50 to 80 people who are doing the things that that I want to do, and I didn't have to pay. I got to help serve these people, and I am in front of them with a name tag, and so they now know who I am. I get to strike up conversations, and they associate me with this space and, and this event that they. They hold dearly. That's pretty cool. And they're all paying to be there. So that's why it was a huge break. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, and for the listener's benefit, Joel mentioned uh, Joe Costanza, who was, I think, 24? 24. At the, uh, 20, 24. Bought his first investment property, going against his parents, buying his first investment property. Uh, he already has a second, and I believe it's already fully rented. Yep. And now his parents are on board with buying, helping him buy the third property. So uh, he's doing well. <laughs> he's doing very well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we, didn't, we, don't, we don't just lie and see if we can make anyone successful. He's, he's rolling. Yep. I think he's 20, might be 26 now. Yeah. But uh, yeah, no, he's rolling. And yeah, Michael, Luke and Michael Ryrot, they've been on this podcast. Michael's been on this podcast before. Hopefully, maybe we'll have him back again soon. Uh, but yeah, that was, they're up to some impressive stuff. But you see that, you saw in their mindset. Yep. One of the biggest takeaways from my interview with Michael was they don't have it figured out, but they're confident that they will figure it out. Yeah. Right. Versus we see you've seen you've, you've now that you're in our world, you see a lot more people who who have who don't start. Yeah. Because they're waiting for all the answers, or they don't believe in themselves. Those two are are they're very interesting obstacles. I think I personally have never needed all the answers to go do something. However, the self confidence hasn't always been there. And I think that was another part of the big break. It's just that, yeah, I don't know. Being in that atmosphere, it, confidence rubs off. And it was, I think that's definitely something that was afforded to me, just being in those early IWIN, meet, IWIN meetings. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you've had some previous real estate education yep. that was not cheap. Not cheap. Before you ever met me. Yep. So if anyone thinks my stuff's expensive, <laughs> uh, without naming names, can, can you uh, let the listener know what type of real estate education you were doing before we ever met? Yeah, private courses. It was, uh, I didn't get the mentorship package. You could have got a, uh, got a mentorship package, but I just, I read, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and I was like, I need to try, I need to get into real estate. 
And so when I saw these courses come up, I just went for it and took the plunge. And, you know, so you pay $900 for a weekend course. And that was like, I remember driving home after, after making that credit card purchase, like pumped with adrenaline because I didn't know what I had just gotten into. Mm-hmm. Now I look at it and I was like, oh yeah, no, that makes sense. But it was a complete mindset shift for me at the time. Anyway, make a long story short, I uh, ended up buying into wholesaling course package, uh, buy, rent, and hold package, and uh, and then just some introductory stuff. And it definitely got me rolling. I don't know if it was necessary I, after you know being introduced to these. They make it look like they're the only ones that can give you the information. I think that's the only beef I have with, with the courses. Otherwise, I'm completely grateful for them. Paying the money I paid lit a fire under my butt and and got me going and and gave me drive Mm -hmm. i had skin in the game i had to do something now that i'd put all this money into it so i'm grateful Mm -hmm. the information is out there if someone has drive and low risk tolerance or high risk tolerance (laughs) um you know they, they can figure it out however if you can get, I think the best way to go about it is if you can get in with a group of people Mm -hmm. who have already done this and you compensate your, instead of paying like out the wazoo for uh, the courses, get your own education, but complement that with people who have already done it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the the, probably the most cost efficient and effective way to Mm -hmm. get your education. Mm -hmm. What I have observed is I think people know on this show, I've talked a lot about coaching and stuff like that. For a lot of these courses, I can hire one of the top Canadian coaches there is. Yeah. Many of the top Can- top coaches in Canada are about 10000 for a year, Canadian dollars, and it's local. And it's local, yeah. And it's local, and it's local. <laughs> 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 and these guys are killers. I say that as a compliment. Mm. <laughs> yeah. These guys are killers, and they produce killers, right? Several, uh, several um, uber super successful coaching clients. Uh, I know because uh, I've referred many of my clients to these people, and they still remember my clients, and I see their progress. Many of them achieve their goals in terms of uh, usually giving up a day job, or they give up a, a previous work uh, commitment. Like for example, uh, I have contractor friends who, when they when they made the switch, they stopped doing contracting for for clients. Now they became their only client, mm-hmm. right? Them and their joint venture partners. But yep. Yeah. Just, just from my experience. Because uh, a lot of stuff is really expensive up there. Uh, and again, just like you said, though, like a lot of people are really grateful for that experience. Just like any investment, though, I think it has to be return. And I think you can get a higher return for, if you just hire one of these top, top end coaches. And you get, the, you get the accountability and the push. And this is something that I've, I've really seen. Before, I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have gone for that. It's all about the self driven you know, learn and do it yourself kind of thing. And since working with you and, and seeing how you and Cherry operate and the rest of the team for that matter, coaching, it's not just about the information. It's about motivation to carry through, right? And so have like, what's a coach in any sports team or any athlete going to do? They're going to push them to the next level. And they're going to be able to point out the weaknesses, not just to condemn them and get down on them, but to help them build up in those areas. And, and so that, you know, it's performance oriented, but it's, it's for a reason, right? It's for a purpose. So whereas two years ago, even the idea of buying a course was, was a shift now, like it's gone so far now where in my personal life. So personally, I love, I love singing. I love music. I'm looking for a vocal coach, <laughs> you know, like it's just, I'm not going to mess around when I know that I can get better with someone who knows what they're doing and can help help me in the areas that I'm weak. So mm-hmm. cool. I fear Mary Clements uh, teaches singing. <laughs> you know Mary, know don't you? Um, I believe so. I, uh, Charles is Charles Waz wife. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, fantastic. I didn't realize it was her last name. Yeah, she didn't take on Charles's last name. <laughs> Good for her. <laughs> Not that it matters. So, can you talk to your your experience in applying the early education that you got, mm-hmm. the early real estate education yep. you got? Dove in, went for it. Within six months, got my first wholesale deal. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, before you say, before you got in there, what did you do? Yep. What was the investment of, of money and time? Uh, and that's effort? a very good question. Let's just talk about. Let's not just talk about the wins. Let's yeah. talk about how, how you earned it. What didn't get me there? Anyway, what didn't get me there was 
I was up at three o'clock, three thirty some mornings putting up bandit signs on Hamilton Mountain. <laughs> that didn't get me anywhere, but it explain, got me moving. Explain this to the listener what a bandit sign is. It's called a bandit sign because it's technically illegal by bylaw. <laughs> Shouldn't be doing that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't anymore. But there are plastic signs, those vinyl plastic signs you see on telephone poles or at stop signs that say we buy houses for cash fast. Here's a phone number. Mm-hmm. I got calls, but it none of it came through to anything. If there had been some consistency, maybe, but I ramped up the bandit signs in the summer. So that was the summer of 2018. I ramped up the bandit signs in the summer of 2019, even did it with a partner and we did a lot and we, and we hit, we hit different markets and all we got were calls from cities saying, if you don't take your bandit size down, we're going to charge you 150 bucks a piece. <laughs> and we put up hundreds. <laughs> the unfortunate part of the bandit sign strategy is that it's been taught for a long time. A long time. So many people have done it before you yeah. and, and irked enough neighbors that, the, that it became, get on the radar of the city. <laughs> yeah. And you end up becoming a nuisance. And so anytime your name shows up in the mailbox accompanied with the bandit signs, there's already a negative connotation or a negative impression in people that you have to work through to get mm-hmm. over. So, you know, it's not the impression I want to make. Mm-hmm. So, but what it did do was it got me out, got me up early in the morning, got me out doing something, putting money into my own marketing. The next piece of marketing that I was doing was just driving for dollars. This is where, and trying to figure out ways, you know, all the education on in the that comes out of the states it's so easy to find out who owns the house in the states so easy privacy is just non-existent in the states we are so protective of our privacy which as an as an individual i like that as a business person it would be nicer if there were a few less restrictions but uh make it easier to market to people but it is what it is and so you got to figure out ways to get around and that's what i figured out oh i can go to city hall and find you know tax records that's how I found uh, that was the Holton deal. And so sent out my first round of yellow letters, self-addressed or whatever, hand addressed. And uh, within a couple of weeks, got a call. And that was that was pretty exhilarating. That whole process was really cool. Confirmation that you know what I learned works with the effort and had to go through the emotions of okay i my name is now on a on a legally binding contract and if this doesn't go through i'm on the hook this may not be the best thing to admit but i do not have the means to go through with this the deal's perfectly closed and everybody's happy but so i don't think it matters but that was the case like i had to figure out a way to get into real estate without having any money i had no savings at the time i had a i was a barista you know i was supporting my wife and at the time year old little girl. And, you know, that's tough to do on a barista's wage. And you were the full income earner? Yeah. Earner? All right. Yeah. And so I needed something, you know, and I wanted to invest in real, well, I wanted a future. I wanted a, I wanted a solid financial future. And I saw that real estate could provide that. It didn't necessarily have to be real estate, but I like, I like doing deals. I like the idea of negotiating a deal, of coming to terms, of of finding win-wins, finding solutions, and putting an asset in someone's hands. And so being able to actually follow through with that, even when I didn't have the means to necessarily close on it, was completely eye-opening. There were all these rules that are preached in, in, in society, and, you know, for good measure, like have a down payment, be able to qualify. It's so much easier. So much less stress, for sure. Um, but going through the emotions of not being of of like being on title and having to find a buyer and then finally finding a buyer, but that's still not necessarily being finding someone to sign the contract to you, but that's still not necessarily being it, the end. You know, have to learn how to navigate the the anxiety of that. You know, what happens if this doesn't work out? Well, don't think like that. It's gonna work. Make it work, figure it out. And that was that was a huge piece too. So the vast majority of our clients have good paying jobs. Mm-hmm. Most of them, almost all of them already have a home that they own and have significant equity. So how did you arrive in your situation? And like the better question I like to ask you people is, what would you teach your daughter to do differently than, what, than the path that you chose? 
I think we covered it a little bit in the last time I was on the on the podcast. We only had half the listeners then. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's a good point. <laughs> I went to Bible college. When I graduated high school, I wanted nothing to do with business. I, I just wanted to be a pastor in a, in a church somewhere. I didn't care if it was even a big church and wanted anything to do with money. Before I found real estate, I had I was going to spend all my time praying, quite literally. That was my life. I was completely content with it. That's all I wanted. A few things happened, um, hit, hit obstacles that com- pretty significantly shifted my direction of my life. And so I had to adjust. Thankfully, that's when real estate came along. What it meant was, though, with not having put any emphasis on my financial future, I had to start from scratch at 28 years old with a wife and a kid. So And rent to pay. And rent to pay and bills. I was literally, at one point, you know, to put this all into perspective, I was literally believing that God was going to provide my needs without, without working, it, you know, like a missionary. That was, that was the mindset. It was a missionary mindset in, in the city where I was just going to serve the city as, as, as a missionary, serve the needy in the city as a missionary. And I have feelings about that. Um, I have friends who, who are, and, you know, it's, they are wonderful people. Um, we've also talked about this though, but I just, I have, my dreams are different. Like, I want to affect change in on scale. Yeah, I'm going to need money to do that. I want to be I, like these people who, if it's truly their passion to just like, and, and if they actually are serving the needy, you know, and they're not just looking for a paycheck, I want to be able to support them, build a charity that like supports work that actually impacts communities. I just don't have the stomach to be the person who has to live on a prayer anymore. Coming from that, that's what, that's what, when I found real estate, that's where I was at. Start from a new, <laughs> at the age of 28. What else has changed? So we talked about uh, when you started volunteering for, for my organization, you, you, you came to our charity events as well. Uh, I don't know if I've actually gotten out to a handle. Oh, handle gee. We're we're the, we're, 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 I wanted to, to come that, up I'll for things. i write that down for, yeah. our, for the next job review. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wanted to do this. Uh, oh, this will probably release after Thanksgiving. But um, <laughs> I wanted to come to the Thanksgiving one, uh, and then I realized I'd already booked <laughs> the cottage with my siblings for Thanksgiving. So, <laughs> so what? What did volunteering for my organization? What happened after? Yeah, more opportunity to to keep volunteering. Um, well, you stopped volunteering at some point. <laughs> yeah, it it ramped up first before it stopped. So we're helping out with Iwin then. Uh, helping out with Stock Hacker. After that, the, I remember the conversation. Or well, I remember the, the the Facebook message after the November Stock Hacker course, and I said, "Hey, I have some ideas for marketing Stock Hacker." And you're like, "Well, we need we need someone to coordinate our marketing efforts. Want to talk about that?" I was like, "Heck yes!" And so I had that conversation, and it just seemed to fit really well on both ends mm-hmm. and became your marketing coordinator then in, in January 2020 marketing manager and everything that it is now and you give the barista thing completely before anyone goes starts pitching me ideas <laughs> you have a background in marketing yes yes I do <laughs> yeah uh, I I did um, took some copywriting courses I'd been uh, Marketing for accounting firms, charities, um, b- local bookstore on my own, just freelance stuff. I so it's stuff I I was familiar with and had, mm-hmm. and had skills to bring as mm-hmm. well. But you you guys were super gracious and and you were learning too. So I think I think the timing was perfect. As much of a grind as 2019 felt like, it it totally made sense when this opportunity came along. Mm-hmm. And you took Stock Hacker. Which one did you take? November. November. All right. You didn't pay for that one, right? No, I volunteered. Because right. I was already, because you needed someone to handle the Facebook group and write the quick start guide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I wrote the quick start guide, which I had. <laughs> so I didn't even technically need the intro course because by the time we got to it, I had, I had pieced everything together from the Facebook group because <laughs> they didn't even have the recordings from the September 
beta course out yet. So, mm-hmm. um, between piecing together the strategy from p- nuggets on the Facebook group and playing around in the app myself mm-hmm. and, and they, they, um, we were doing weekly webinars too. So that definitely, mm-hmm. that was probably the biggest help. Yeah. I wrote the first version of the quick start guide and then, um, volunteered at stock hacker. You were able to learn this without even taking the course. <laughs> yeah. Without the weekend part of the course. Without the weekend part of the course. <laughs> right, yeah. right. So there's really no excuse for anyone not to not be able to do this going through the weekend course and all the other materials that we provide. Granted, I had I had, did have the access to the coaching webinars. So But that's available to all the students. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's it's had someone explaining it. I didn't have someone walk me through each strategy individually, but I remember I remember the the Iwin meeting when the idea was first pitched Uh and looking at it and being like, son of a gun, I wish I had the capital for that. Uh I'd do it so fast. Like it made sense right away. I don't know. It just clicked. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm just geared for it, but like it's, I've I've had fun with it ever since. That's hilarious. You went from like wanting nothing to do with money to like, (laughs) Hey, there's money there. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You figured out the money. (laughs) Yeah. I figured out the money. Well, I figured out the money because Living as a as a barista mm-hmm. on a barista's wage, we had to figure out how to how to make ends meet, uh-huh. and still, you know, and, and it was a it was a it was imperative that we put some money away for our daughter. So we we're putting at least a little bit away for our daughter. So we had to figure out how to make ends meet and save a little bit. It wasn't incredible amounts, but it was a little bit off each paycheck. Mm-hmm. So when I started working with you, we didn't change anything. I just, we just kept living like that, but started saving a lot more Mm -hmm. and got to a point where pretty quickly, where I was able to fund an account. That's kind of neat. Your real estate education and your marketing education that you did on your own. Yeah. On your own time and on your own dime. Yeah. Led you to a better opportunity. 100%. Yeah. It's funny because I've had a lot of young people say, like, I don't make I don't make enough money. I don't have enough money to make, to invest. So this is general advice I usually give. Folks, don't take advice from me. I'm not licensed or anything to give advice. <laughs> but for, for young people or people who don't have trouble saving, I often say, you know, you need to invest in yourself. Yeah. Like I often hear people say, like, I have like 20 grand. Should I do, should I take this real estate course or should I buy a house or I do stocking or whatever? My first opinion is you should probably invest in yourself. So you can build a skill that will lead you to a higher paying job. Mm-hmm. And in my experience, the fastest way is usually sales mm-hmm. and or marketing. Preferably both. <laughs> Preferably, yeah. <laughs> or real estate, right? It, you know, I know lots of talented, talented, talented agents, real estate agents, because they have really good sales skills, right? And also in my, in my previous uh, life, when I worked for IBM, who were the highest paid people there? The salespeople. The salespeople. Right, so maybe that's a skill that people need to work on. And we're going to have a uh, Grant Cardone Canada on on the podcast soon enough to talk Ooh, about that as well. Yeah, yeah. Corey Corey Leaf is a friend, cool awesome. guy, and he's like your age, <laughs> and he makes an absurd amount of money. <laughs> yeah, because he's ridiculously good at sales and teaching sales to people, and then they've grown a significant sales organization. Yeah. So yeah. So yeah, I'll be excited to have that on because uh, again, a lot a lot of people have trouble with the the income side first. Yes. Like even though we. Like, even though a lot, most people listening to this are trying to get out of a job, there are some people listening to this who are who need, honestly, a better job. Yeah. And even if you work for yourself, I consider that a job. So just use that as one term. So you mentioned stock hacking. You like it. I love it. So actually, before I get to that, I posed you the question, what would you do with if you had $150,000? Oh, yeah. Because we've been, over lunch, we talk about real estate investing. We talk about stock hacking. We talk about generally wealth hacking, family, mm-hmm. stuff like that. So I don't even know why I asked you that question originally, but I just threw it at you. What would you do with one hundred fifty thousand? Because you were you've always been on this real estate path, yeah. And I believe what I said was, oh, I think you needed to to go back to the beginning, go back to your goals. First of all, how'd you get to those goals? So let's go back to there, because you were on this path like I'm getting a house no matter what. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was it was actually after a, a team meeting and. We were having lunch with the team, and I don't know where the question came from. <laughs> you were sitting, sitting next to each other. What would you do with one hundred fifty thousand? If you had one hundred fifty thousand to invest, and I was stopped dead in my tracks because at that point, like, I still had this 
engine to in me to invest in real estate, but stock hacking was working for me. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, shoot, I don't know. Like I've, I've been so focused on real estate and building up a down payment or figuring out ways to find deals off market or whatever, that now that like going through the thought process of I actually have this money, what do I want to do with it? I hadn't done that in a, in a while. And so I wasn't sure. And then um, I didn't have, I didn't have a good answer for you that first time you asked. That's okay. The, <laughs> and so the next week woke up, I don't wake up at three in the morning anymore. <laughs> I'll wake up at five just because I'm a morning person and I need that time to like gear up mentally and physically, but, and then I'm in bed early, but I was up again for the first time in a long time. And I was up before my alarm. It was like three 20 in the morning. I was like, what the heck is going on? So I went, just sat downstairs on the couch, hoping that I would just get tired and fall asleep. But I didn't. I sat there for like 30 minutes, just staring into nothing. I was like, this is dumb. So I opened up my phone, went to realtor.ca, just started searching houses. So I come from up north. I come from the North Bay area. Super cheap real estate up there. Rents, uh, I mean, they're, they're not Hamilton rents, but they're definitely like pretty good for uh, the price that you're paying. A cash flow market, not an appreciation market, but a cash flow market. The So I'm like, man, I, need, I just need to do this. Like, I'm so tired of like coming and hawing. Like, I just need to act. I message so many different investors and I'm a realtor that I've been talking to and like a property manager I'd talked to, like just reconnect. Cause before COVID, I had actually, I was gunning for it too. And then COVID hit and, and a bunch of other things hit and yeah, I'd stalled out some plans. And so I was like, you know, what? I need to, I need to hop back on this. So I'm serious about it now. And we go, we go, I, had, I wanted to pick your brain on it. So I'd take you out for lunch. And that's when you asked, what are your goals? He was like, well, cash flow. He's like, well, how much are you cash flowing on in your in your stock portfolio? Oh, that's a good question. Actually, that was just before we went out. Stock for hacking. You're stock gonna, hacking. Don't own stock. No, it's true. <laughs> that's an important distinction when it comes to stock hacking. I don't own any stock. How am I doing with my stock hacking? And this was actually before lunch. So I went back and looked at my realized profits for August, and my jaw dropped. I had made eight hundred dollars on just over ten thousand dollars in cash in my account in August. And I, I sat back and I thought, I was like, could I do that with real estate? I'm not buying a property, even in North Bay, with $10,000 cash down, unless I'm moving in. And even then, maybe not. And I'm not cash flowing $800 if I'm moving into the property, for sure. Like, I don't know, like, let's say I could put $10,000 down on a property. I didn't have to move in, didn't have to do any work, and I'm cash flowing $800, $800 a month. I have to. Uh, I have to manage tenants. I have to, there's the landlord tenant board that now hovers over my head. And if it's North Bay, it's long distance. How long is the drive? Uh, f three and a half, four hours, depending on traffic. What's, and, and what about in the winter when it snows? Yeah. Four, four and a half hours, depending on, on what the, what the conditions are like. I mean, I do it all the time. So the only reason why I pick North Bay is because I grew up in that area. My dad, my brother lived there. So. I like I wouldn't invest in Windsor or or, or um, like Thunder Bay. I'm not just, I'm not specifically looking for a cash flow market. It's just I have connection there. I'm mm -hmm. in that area anyway. Mm -hmm. It makes sense if I want to get into real estate. It could work there. Mm -hmm. But I have all these. I have to worry about a physical building and people that I have to manage now. But with the stock hacking, I don't. I I don't have to worry about anything. Now, to be fair, September sucked. I made some dumb moves and stuff that I you know, learned from and fixable for sure and uh, lost 100 bucks in September. But since July, so I started trading real money in July. I made $400. I realized net profit $400 in July. So net average is $400 a month. And if you weren't stupid in September, what would you have done? Probably would have done another $400. Uh, it was, September was a tricky month. So even, even if conservatively I said 200, like it's $1,400 across. So it's almost $500 a month cash flow. If I hadn't without the lessons. <laughs> right. Yeah. But it's, we're recording this on October 7th and the market's kind of back. Yeah. <laughs> so you would have, you probably, you know. I've probably taken, uh, I took $120 at the beginning of the week. And then I took another 50 yesterday. You're doing okay. Yeah. As long as I stick to, you know, what I know to be safe and, mm -hmm. and 
smart. Mm-hmm. October's gearing up to be another good month. Mm-hmm. And just just to be be transparent, uh, just as folks understand, you're only able to do what you do because of the, the the 2.0 version of the course. Yeah, the original version didn't teach you the no. strategies you're using today. No, right. there are strategies that. I needed that allow me to do more with my money. I can make more trades mm-hmm. without getting too technical. I can make more trades mm-hmm. knowing exactly what I'm risking on each trade. Mm-hmm. And so, which allows me to also make very accurate calculations of what my returns are. Mm-hmm. Whereas with the first version, although the first version unpacked the basics, it my momentum wouldn't have been as good. I wouldn't have been able to... Um, oh, I definitely wouldn't have achieved four hundred dollars in that first month. Right, right. Because right. before we were recording, we were talking about someone we we're trying to help out mm. who took the original version, mm-hmm. who's now able to cover the interest on the money. Right. So we're gonna try to help her out. Yeah. Get her to use the more intermediate strategies mm-hmm. that were taught in the two point version, so that she can get back to doing, get back to stock hacking. Hopefully, replicate your results. And it's a bit of a learning curve. Especially, you know, when dealing with the, the technology, there's no denying that. I, I had my frustrations. Oh no, but she's already fine though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. It's just taking the, the next step. <laughs> for sure, I think her. I think she's gonna fly. Like, I, I think once she once she grasps this, it's gonna just be. She's gonna be loving it. Um, I don't know her personally. I just had a couple conversations oh, with her know? since. But she's lovely. Yeah, I, I, like I've heard. I've heard her on the. I think I met her at one uh, at one of the IWIN meetings. But you know, hearing her on the on the podcast and um, anyway, I don't want to go. In, to too much of that but like it's going to be she's going to love this and but for anybody else out there like especially like any students who are particularly listening right now and there might be frustrations with the app or anybody who ever just looked at this and it's like oh that's that's too complicated it's really not like it's a system like anything else like i think trying to figure out real estate contracts was was more complicated than this especially because as much as Aria has, the, sorry, Ontario Real Estate Association has their copyright on what a real estate contract is, there is no black and white as to what has to be in a real estate contract. And once you realize that, it's like wide open mm-hmm. all of a sudden, mm-hmm. which is cool and freaking nerve wracking because you're not sure what has to be in there. Like you're not sure what's going to cover your butt. You're not sure what you know what you're exposing yourself to. Mm-hmm. There's way more risk involved with mm-hmm. real estate. Oh, and if you found it difficult, try, difficult, try explaining that to the seller yeah. who barely knows you. Yeah, and it's all written by lawyers, so it's not easy to understand. Yep, exactly. It's like it's like reading Shakespeare for the first time. Yeah, it's not easy to understand. No, uh, it's a whole other language. Reading Shakespeare like the tenth time, it's still not easy to understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm super grateful for uh, and Lee's like the way he unpacks these strategies was such a relief. Like I, I remember, I remember the first that April course, and like reading his book is one thing. That was that was definitely helpful. Okay, so hang on, hang on. We're talking about Lee Lowell. Sorry, yeah. Uh, and he wrote the book "Get Rich with Options," mm-hmm. uh, best-selling author. Uh, for any Canadian who's listening, it's actually hard to get a copy of his book. Yeah, uh, it's really popular, but anyone can get it on a Kindle. Please don't try the audio version. I don't understand how people can read charts and graphs. Yeah, you really the audio need to version. see this stuff. <laughs> Worst case, Kindle it. Uh, I don't even know if you can print Kindles. Can you print Kindles? I don't know. Oh. I've never tried. Mm, me neither. I have a Kindle, so you know, I read it I, if I want to see the, if I and I'll use the app on my computer yeah. to view it. Sorry, I cut you off. Go ahead. No, that's fine. That's good clarification. Lee Lowell, fantastic teacher. All right. And April was April 2020, which was the first time we delivered the Stock Hacker all new uh, 2.0 version. 2.0, all right, right. With Lee Lowell. Yep. All right, go. <laughs> that first course helped me clarify so much stuff. So I was trading paper. Like it, at that point, it really was just a game for me. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm in the app. I've been trading since November uh, in, in fake with fake money, just playing around, having fun, semi seriously, trying to emulate how I would actually trade with real money, but also making moves that I'm unsure about. And that I want to see how, see what happens. Okay. If I do this in this kind of market, what happens? Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was, that was excellent learning, but it's still, you don't have, there's so much information that you just don't have. And so with, you don't have a grid or a framework to interpret the information that's coming at you. Then Lee Lowell teaches the April course and it just binds it all together with a common thread or a few common threads. And it made it a lot easier. And it, it's what it's what enabled me to 
do the, the, the particulars, it's called spreads, but I won't dive into detail. It, it's what enabled me to confidently do spreads. And so when I finally funded my account in, and I could practice now and understand what was happening in the app and how they responded to the markets. And when I finally funded my account in July, my first trade was actually a put, but I think it was a put on AMD, but it was cheaper then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was. And it worked out great. I forget what I actually took on it, but, um, but the next, it was all spreads for the most part. Mm-hmm. I still do puts every now and then. I like the, the liquidity. So they move faster. <laughs> <laughs> They're a little easier to get in and out of, but, um, for efficiency's sake, it's been mostly spreads. Now, was I ever negative on doing real estate? I just want to clarify that. <laughs> I don't think so. No, never negative. It's always just a question of what's the best option. What's going to actually carry you to well, your literal question? Well, what are your goals? What are your financial goals? You know, what's going to get you there? Mm-hmm. So it's just a re- reevaluating with the information you have because that information changed. Mm-hmm. Do you remember what my real, my advice to you around real estate was? I don't know if you actually, I don't know if you specifically said do this or do that, but what you said led me to, um, well, you did, you, you said, you know, like, where's the appreciation and where's the demand? And it's so weird because like, especially after the, after taking the real estate courses, like don't invest for appreciation. And now, now I'm like, I would, I, I see like if I can cash flow better with stock hacking and I'm not investing in real estate specifically to cash flow, then yeah, hundred percent, I'm going to invest for appreciation, but not just not, not banking on it. I want to invest in real estate as a store of value. So as I make money, as I get better in, in my sales and marketing skills, as, as I do, you know, more deals, building my financial muscles and my bank account building my stock hacking portfolio and bank account. I'm going to need somewhere to put that money so that it's so that inflation doesn't eat away at it. And at this point in time in history, real estate is the best way to do that. I think I really like the, actually the analogy that you used. You said you could buy a few houses in Windsor, uh, North Bay, Sudbury, wherever, you know, where they're cheaper, or you could buy, a house in Hamilton or you could buy like a triplex in Hamilton, or if you want to even go that far, you could buy, buy a triplex in Toronto, less tenants, less maintenance, same value, better appreciation. And that, that got me thinking a lot too. That's kind of what led me to the store of value concept. Mm-hmm. I've been listening to, um, Oh, just to add to that, uh, the point I was trying to make was this, there's a general obsession about numbers out there in terms of the count of properties people own or the right. number of doors. Yep. Right. The conversation is going down like you you mentioned as an example for the price of a house in Hamilton, I can buy two in North Bay. Yep. And I would say, why do you want two houses? You have two roofs, two lawns. Yes. Two. You have double the tenants, which mean double the problems. You have two everything's two, two furnaces, two air conditioners. Right, all these things that can break, and that you are legally required to fix. Yeah. Right. Versus, you can have one house. Yep. Right. I know you have more tenants, but then, then you can size it up, do a duplex or a triplex. Right. And then I said you can do a give as extreme as you look at the people in Toronto. Right. They'll do a triplex for like one point two million dollars, but it's three three tenants that pay a lot of rent. Great profile. Great tenant profile. Only one roof. Only mm-hmm. One furnace. Usually it's only one furnace. Sometimes they have a couple. Mm-hmm. But again, like, where's the, why the obsession with multiple houses? Mm-hmm. Because you look at, talk to any multifamily investor. Yes. They all want scale. Right. So this obsession with having multiple doors in terms of like multiple houses. Houses. Yeah. Right. I, I don't, I personally don't understand it. Yeah. Right. You're yeah, listening to Seth Ferguson at this point in the last po- podcast episode is how he talks about multifamily mm-hmm. very eye-opening and motivating especially without rent control <laughs> well yeah in the states yeah for sure <laughs> I, I'm, it's not to say i'm gunning for a for a triplex in toronto right now you no, know I just, I just want to stretch your bronx exactly your yeah and it got me thinking and it 
listening to uh, the Bitcoin Standard book about it, really just about money and, and what money is, what it actually is, and what makes money money, what makes it valuable. Nothing really. <laughs> really, exactly. It's decisions that that the collective make. Uh-huh. You know, it's the market. That's exactly what the market is. Yeah. Now, I'm not I'm not rip roaring to go out and buy Bitcoin, but I love I love the analysis of like first of all, is it saleable? Are people going to buy and sell it? Mm-hmm. People, is there a demand for it? Second of all, is it a store of value? Is it consumable or is it scarce? Land is stinking scarce, especially in southern Ontario. Mm-hmm. Developable, developable land, mm-hmm. and that people actually want to live in. Exactly, that's a reasonable drive to something. <laughs> yeah, with with civilization at hand, you know, having a store of value. The, the, first of all, the idea that my money could actually devalue over time. I hate that idea, as I'm sure many other people do as well. Of course, you work so hard for it. Exactly. Looking at real estate less as a financial freedom instrument, not completely removed from that equation, still needed to build wealth, still would love cash, still looking for cash flow on any property I ever want to buy. Mm -hmm. It's a part of what makes it a safe investment, but less leaning less on real estate as that particular particular vehicle to financial security. And just as equally as protecting the effort, I, the, the effort I'm putting in today to make the dollar that I'm making right now is going to, is best done in a piece of land with a building on it somewhere in, a, in not just anywhere in a, in a market that is, is in demand. Mm-hmm. That's Hamilton. That's Toronto. That's mm-hmm. anywhere in, the, in southern Ontario right now. Maybe, you know, who knows where that ends up being in 10 years from now, but, you know, it doesn't matter. Like, <laughs> what can we invest in 10 years from now? Exactly. Real estate wise. Yeah. What's that even going to look like? I hear complaints about Windsor already. Oh, man. <laughs> how nuts it is and how hard it is to get a property. Like, how long does that last and that you can still cash flow if you can't cash flow today? I don't, I personally don't know Windsor numbers that well. I just I hear, either. I hear the complaints about how many offers there are. Yeah. So, and like, Windsor is like, it's right on the border. <laughs> Where do you go beyond? And I joke with, I jokingly say, oh, you're going to Detroit next. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know there's some uh, tax and uh, immigration issues with that, but uh, it's a joke, <laughs> folks. It's a joke. <laughs> I think, you know, you know, I like playing with the idea of investing in the States eventually, just to, just to mess with that idea. It's an attractive option, I think, someday, once COVID's over, maybe, if it ever ends. Because <laughs> like in 10 years from now, it's not out of the question that all of our real estate doubles. Hundred percent. So then, how do you make that cash flow? Well, when I started taking the real estate courses, statistic was your the generally the value of your house in any typical market is going to double every twelve years. Yeah. I think that's quicker now. Well, it's yeah. definitely been quicker in the past five years. Yeah. But I I wonder if that pace has permanently sped up. I can't say it permanently. <laughs> but even still, like I think the point is though is that the the month a dollar doesn't buy the same as it did no ten years ago, and it won't be the same a year from now. No. And, and uh, you know, we all got into real estate for the cash flow. Yeah. So what do we do as it keeps dwindling? As that each property we have to put more money into. Mm-hmm. And before we start recording, we're talking about, you know, duplex strategy, right? Yeah. To buy the house, it's usually at least 100 grand for, for the down payment at least. And then the renovation is going to cost at least 100 grand and take some time. You're going to have some carrying costs and all those sorts of things to try and cash flow 500 to $1,000, right? And then you can, and I see your success, stock hacking, and I see our all of our students. Yeah, because I know what you're capable of. Because I see what all the other students are doing. Mm-hmm. That's what they tell me. I know I see what I do myself. But it's all possible. Mm-hmm. So, do you have an answer? What are you going to do if you have 150 thousand? I don't even know why I came up with that number. Yeah, I don't know either. Uh, for now, it would be, I think I would put it into an account because I could I could probably make enough money. To not have to worry about working on 150. Oh, that's not a good idea. Then. <laughs> Everyone's like, no, 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 don't do that. No, no, no. We kind of need you to. We kind of need you to stay, stay managing around here. That might be pushing it. I, I think I would definitely put it into into my stock hacking mm-hmm. and have a goal for the next two three years to either start. I would have to build an actual like financial system for myself. Where okay, now I'm serious. Now, now it's not because right now I'm just basically using stock hacking as an accelerated savings account instead of it sitting in a savings account and earning two cents. It 
got me $1,200. So from that, the mindset shifts to, okay, now, now it needs to be actually funneled into something. So I need to grow it to a certain number so that I can buy this kind of property that performs in this way and then start create a, create my own, my own system where I can start doing that over and over again. I actually think that's the future for real estate investing. Yeah. Because again, we all do this with the cash flow. You know, I think I, I have some gold and I have some silver. I don't have any cryptocurrency, mm-hmm. but, but uh, I want cash flow, mm-hmm. <laughs> right. which is why I do this, uh, which is why I stock hack and I'll still always own real estate because there's no other greater asset vehicle to, to create wealth. Yeah. Right. I yeah. can turn one property into two properties and then down the road, I can turn those two properties into four properties and rinse and repeat. Right. I can't do that with anything else. Yeah. So, but again, I need cash flow. Yeah. Because <laughs> as I keep leveraging those houses, I'm losing cash flow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the rent does not keep up. Yeah. That's just the reality of things. Yeah. Yeah. I, so it, it's not in the, but for the beginning real estate investor, I'm not saying don't do it. It's just you're going to have to work that much harder. It's not, you know, they, I remember the examples in the textbooks that I got from the real estate courses. So it was actually Canadian content. I they had Hamilton and Oshawa examples, mm-hmm. and they weren't that old. They were at the time, you know, in 2018, they might have been two or three years old. They did not mirror the market at the time, for sure. And so now, so it was a weird, it was a weird time to start out in real estate because I'm learning, I'm learning these concepts, and the examples are being used in my backyard, in markets in my backyard. And I can't do that anymore. You can't you can't find a single family home and have a cash flow five hundred dollars a month. It just doesn't work in Hamilton. You can duplex it and cash flow five hundred dollars a month, but you're putting another hundred and twenty thousand dollars on top of the now hundred hundred and twenty thousand dollars you're putting down on the property. Mm-hmm. And then to refi, you're probably not pulling out two hundred and forty thousand dollars in value. No, you're not because you're only refining out 80% of, of that value. So you still have money left in the property. So you don't even have access to all of that cash again. It's still sweet. It's still awesome that you can pull out, you know, pull out money and, and do and at least be on your way to doing it again. But mm-hmm. I had to grapple with the reality that what I'm being taught, the environment in which that was created and what I'm actually entering into is very different. And so that was that added to the learning curve too, realizing that, oh, these calculations that worked two years ago don't work anymore. And unless I invest in North Bay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's why, that's why I initially had the obsession with North Bay. Right. Are you still going to do the deals in North Bay? I don't know. Something comes along, maybe, for my dad, for my brother, probably. Um, but we had I'm, this conversation. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah. Do you remember what I said? Keep your charity separate from your investing. <laughs> Yeah, 100%. I need to be in a position where I'm free to do that. Cool. That's funny. I say some interesting things. I'm sure some people will be offended by it. That's why we said these things in private conversation. You weren't supposed to share that to <laughs> This is the interviewer who asks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're running out of time, Joel. Joel, thanks for doing this. Thanks for being so candid. Yeah. Uh, anything you want to leave? Anything? Any final comments you want to share for folks? Especially for folks who are stuck on the fence. It's kind of bad, too, because we've given people more options. It's, it's the worst thing you can do is give people more options. Yeah, when you're stuck in analysis paralysis. Uh, I'll just echo the question you asked me. What are, your, what are your goals? What are your financial goals? Yeah, financial goals. Not how many houses you own. Yes. Right? Yeah. Because that number doesn't matter. It what doesn't. matters is how much money you make. <laughs> how do you most efficiently get to, your, to the financial goals that, that you set out for yourself? How much do those financial goals need to shift? So, and I think the other piece was, the other big piece was things change and it's okay. And if what worked before doesn't work now, it's wisdom to acknowledge that and adapt. Doing my best to adapt. Awesome. Cool. If folks want to follow you, how can they follow you? Do you still do your podcast? I don't. I haven't. Uh, I, I focused all my time um, and effort on Iwin. Like happily so it was lined up with my values and, and goals so yeah um and i was only doing it because i i was going to license as a realtor and wanted to begin to develop an audience 
so that when I finally did license, I wasn't marketing to the void. So things changed, so I adapted. <laughs> Are you still getting licensed? It's a good question. <laughs> I, I, starting to, you know, starting to do deals again. The only reason why I wanted to license was because I wanted to be in, in real estate the whole time as much as possible. Now I have the opportunity to do that. So if I don't need to, I don't know, really makes sense. I still have to think about it. But what are my goals? Awesome. Good stuff, Joel. All right. Thanks again for doing this. Thank you. This is awesome.